Welcome to another installment of the Whitaker Myers Wealth Managers What We Learned in the Markets This Week video. We aim to provide you, our valued clients, with a brief video giving you information that is helpful to your understanding of the markets from a biblical worldview with no financial agenda, which makes us uniquely different from the news media in America. This video is for informational purposes only and should not be relied upon to make investment decisions. The clients of Whitaker Myers Wealth Managers may maintain positions in the securities discussed in today's video, all opinions discussed are solely those of John Mark Young and not those of Whitaker Myers Wealth Managers. Hi, I'm John Mark Young. Now, this was the week I live for. Just a ton of economic data. So it either proves right the theory that the economy, despite almost every economist out there being way too pessimistic, including some Christian-based economists that I actually really like, but watched one of their economic summaries this week and super pessimistic. And friends, this week hardly disappointed. And I can't wait to share all this amazing data with you. But to be clear, even in the best years for the economy, the stock market will still probably eventually find something to dislike and make some sort of 10% or 15% correction. And that's okay. That is normal. When flying on an airplane, the first thing I do when I don't like the, the mood of the flight or the situation we're in, turbulence or whatnot, is to look at the flight attendants. If their mood changes, then my mood changes. And that's why we are here to normalize those 10% corrections, those 20% those pullbacks, those 30% pullbacks. Look, they happen. And they're not fun, but they're not the end of the world when it comes to invest. And, and if they were the end of the world, guess what? Here's the good news. There's only one question that matters, and it's not how did you position your IRA? How did, how did your investments align to, to deal with that, that end of the world investment scenario? Well, no, here's what matters. How did you position your soul? In light of the free gift of salvation given by Jesus Christ, thanks to his sacrificial death on the cross to atone for our sins. So guess what? It does, if it's the end of the world situation, it doesn't matter. But it's ne it never is, okay? Most of the time it's not. So before I dive into the economic data that's got me so excited, let's review our standard set of data points. First, we look at the Atlanta Fed's GDP Now model. And I'm going to tell you where we actually came in during the fourth quarter of 2023 in point number two. But right now, we're going to get our first look at where the Atlanta Fed thinks we are in our current quarter, which of course is the first quarter, January through March of 2024. Now remember, historically speaking, we've been around 2% in the last 10 years on the GDP number. Longer term, we should probably be closer to 3%, but our economy is so big now, we don't grow as fast. And guess what? The first reading of the first quarter is right at 3%. And the current estimates for Wall Street analysts, only 1%. Friends, they almost are always wrong. So please don't send your kids to college to study economics because something they are teaching those poor folks is dead wrong. But the Atlanta Fed, they're doing it right. So the first swing, looking good there, but there are lots and lots of data to be released between now and the end of the quarter. So we'll keep watching it every week. Next, we look at the 15-year and the 30-year mortgage rates. And the question we're trying to ask is if they're going down, because if they're going down, that's helping to prove our theme that housing will be a strong driver of economic growth in 2024. And this week, they came in at 5.96% for the 15-year rate and 6.69% for the 30-year rate. So those rates actually did take a tick up, but nothing is linear. Nothing does what we, exactly what we want with its trajectory, so that's okay. Each week, we check out the labor market by looking at the initial claims for unemployment insurance claims and the continuing claims for unemployment insurance. And those hit, the initial claims hit 214,000 this week. And that is people coming on to unemployment insurance for the first time. The continuing claims, those that stayed on, popped up a bit to 1.83 million. While both those numbers did come up from last week, they're still, at least the initial claims, historically low. And finally, let's look at the markets for the last week. The S&P 500, which is our proxy for growth and growth and income. But of course, you can only compare the S&P to growth and growth and income when you compare them together. And this week, the S&P 500 was positive 1.06%. The Russell 2000, which tracks small and mid-sized companies or aggressive growth in our Dave Ramsey vernacular, that took a nice jump up 1.69% this week. And the MSCI EFA, which tracks international stocks across developed markets, excluding the U.S., that had a 1.49% positive week. So for this week, the aggressive growth category 
which is the one that we actually favor for the entire year. That's the one, if we had to guess, we would say he was probably going to do the best this year. They ended the week with the best performance. And now, and now on to point number two. As I mentioned in point number one, and we talked about this last week as well, we got the U.S. GDP report for the fourth quarter of 2023 this week. The Atlanta Fed had us around 2.4% last week when they ended their fourth quarter review. And the average Wall Street economist had us around 1.5%. The Wall Street Journal, for the economists they surveyed, had us around 2%. And the number came in. And it exceeded everybody's expectations. Here's a quick summary. In terms of the growth, the growth number, the economy grew at a solid 3.3% annual rate. Defying forecasts from the Atlanta Fed, they were better than the Atlanta Fed, although they were the closest, and any sort of economist, giving us a robust finish to the end of 2023, more than we initially thought, because remember, this was the fourth quarter of 2023, and it followed a robust 4.9% growth in the third quarter. What were the drivers of this quarter's report? Well, consumer spending, which of course is the backbone of our economy, it is two-thirds of the U.S. economy, that remained absolutely resilient it increased by over 2% quarter over quarter. Additionally, uh, other things that were helpful, government spending, you know, that always happens, but we would prefer less and less of that. Exports helped, providing further momentum, business investments. Uh, those were all things that, that helped contribute to this quarter's report. Some of the highlights, again, solid growth, 3.3% annualized rate in the fourth quarter, and that beat everybody's expectations. Uh, Consumer spending, largest driver, 2%. Um, and business investment, which is businesses making investments, buying supplies, manufacturing equipment, those sort of things, that was also strong, up about 1.9% from the previous quarter. And of course, the fact that inflation is coming down, that is helping economic growth. If, if inflation were still at 8 9%, that would be problematic. But with inflation coming down to that 2% number, that's providing relief that is helping everything, including our GDP numbers uh, there. So now with the fourth quarter number, we actually can see what 2023 came in at from a GDP perspective. And the aggregate growth for the year was 2.5%. And that surpassed everybody's forecasts and expectations. Now, one caveat is this report, the 3.3 for the fourth quarter, is an advanced estimate and can be revised based on more data being coming available. If you remember last quarter's estimate got revised to the upside, we're going to find out on February 28th what the revision looks like. But overall, the fourth quarter GDP report for 2023 suggests the U.S. economy ended the year on a strong note, defying re recession fears that we heard all last year and showing resilience in the face of all kinds of headwinds, geopolitical and in the U.S. Third, let's look at Thursday's report of new home sales in the U.S. The U.S. housing market, once a blazing inferno of activity, has been in a period of recalibration in, in 2022 and 2023. Low inventory levels continue to be a big focus of this market. Inventory levels in December declined by 11%, thus signaling uh, for a strong seller's market again. But sellers beware because low inventory also means finding a new home is going to be difficult for you. Along with the inventory, high mortgage rates and steep home prices have dissuaded many would be home buyers in the last year and a half, two years. But data released on Thursday shows that new U.S. single family homes sold hit 664,000 in December, and that was up from 615,000 month over month. And 636,000 year over year. Now, this is different than what we talked about last week where we discussed existing home sales. Existing home sales are obviously things that are already built, but these are new homes that are being built and being purchased. And this is important to watch because we're nearly 4 million houses short in the US. Thus, that's why we think housing is a good place to be investing because when you have that much shortage, it's gonna give you upward price mobility. Thus, we need to keep building to keep pace with our population growth. So this month's report is a change of 7.97% from last month and 44 from the year ago. And that is good. That's what we want to see. We want to see those numbers going positive. We need a lot more growth than that, but going positive is better than going negative. And as I mentioned earlier, in my opinion, housing is something that will be a strong driver of economic growth in 2024. And here are some reasons why 
we think housing could be a catalyst for growth in the economy this year. First off, a strong economy. So you need a strong economy to have a strong housing market. And to have a robust housing market even push the economy further, again, you need a baseline strong economy. With current low employment rates as we have and steady wage growth as we have, that's going to continue to provide an impetus for housing to be a driver for the economy. Plus, we have all these millennials, which, you know, there's a large share of millennials that are just starting to enter the housing market and they could help sustain demand, especially in the lower home area, which has a ripple effect to the upside. With limited inventory, despite recent increases, uh, housing inventory remains tight in many re regions, and that potentially prevents a dramatic price drop, which could uh, make housing become an impetus for bad economy. Also, we got a very stable financial system right now. We have low foreclosures, high homeowner equity, indicating an overall financial stability in the banking sector and the housing market, which needs to support the banking sector needs to support the housing market. And then we have falling interest rate. Mortgage rates are continuing to drop, as we talked about earlier. And we may even see a further dip through the rest of this year. We expect those numbers, 30-year rates, to be close to the 5% factor. Now, of course, there are some things that could uh, be seen as negatives in the housing market as well, such as with ho high home prices, uh, that remains uh, a impetus for getting some people into the housing market. And of course, there's always these regional disparities where uh, market conditions may vary from this region to that region. And so those are things that could disrupt our theme of a strong housing market for this year. But we think there's a way more positives than negatives. And those positives could push the housing market forward. Good new home data this week. Happy to see it. And finally, point number four, the personal consumption expenditures price index was released this week on Thursday. And it continued to show that inflation is slowing down. Remember, this is the Federal Reserve's preferred inflation gauge. And it gives us a signal to what is happening to prices just like the CPI report does. But this report specifically puts weightings on things that consumers are actually buying. As I always say, it doesn't matter what happens to the price of an apple if you don't buy apples. You just don't care. So from the PCE's report, it's actually looking at what people are buying. From a year-over-year -year perspective, the PCE number came in at 2.6%, which showed continued slowing inflation. As you can see on your screen, that just trend remain, remains intact. It's continued to go downward. Next, the core PCE number, which excludes the volatile food and energy, that had a year-over-year -year, uh, number of 2.93%, which also continues its downward momentum. The PCE numbers peaked at 7.1% in June of 2022. And it's funny how the media can be so deceiving because when I was doing research this week after the PCE number comes out came out, I found a lot of articles that said this month's number is actually a sign that inflation is coming back. Now, why would they say that if you read that or saw that out there? Because of this chart right here, the PCE numbers, if you remember, on a month over month basis went from zero and a negative growth number to now positive again at 20 basis points for both the core and regular number. Oh my goodness, that's a sign inflation's back. Seriously, you get to write for a major media outlet in America and that's your opinion? We were negative, which is technically really bad. You can't have negative inflation. That's disinflation and that's horrible for the economy. Thank the Lord we're positive again. Positive 20 basis points, which is right in the sweet spot. Please, friends. This is why the media is not your friend. They fit the subject to their narrative, and you are lost in the middle. This month's PCE numbers prove once again that we are winning against inflation. If there is a spike, you'll hear it first on this video series. We'll let you know. But these numbers definitely help push the markets positive this week, and they were not a bad sign in our opinion at all. They were right where they needed to come in. Again, you can't have negative numbers. That's not good for the economy. So thanks so much for watching this week's What We Learned in the Markets This Week. If this video series was helpful to you, would you do us a favor? You can do us a favor by hitting the like and subscribe button. The like button helps push our content out to more people. The subscribe button helps make sure that you get these videos as we release them. And if you'd like to meet with any of our financial coaches or financial advisors, our financial coaches help you in baby steps one, two, and three, get out of debt, stay out of debt, live debt free. You can go down to the comment section and hit a, a hit the link down there to schedule a meeting with them or our financial advisors and planners who help you in baby steps four, five, six, and seven. They would love to help you start getting that Roth IRA going, making sure you're doing what you need to do with your company retirement plan 
and helping you make sure you have a plan that works good for you and your family. So thanks so much for watching this week's video. We'll look forward to seeing you next week.